Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, ladies and gentlemen, the producer of the soon-to-be hit TV series, Vigilante Clown Torture Confessions, he is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to torture you. Thanks for telling a friend, and thanks for the five-star reviews. I like your teeth. Tonight we are drinking Devil's Triangle by Florida Beer Company in beautiful Cape Canaveral, Florida. Garage grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. Check out this IPA, golden amber in color with hints of citrus and grapefruit with a strong pine bitterness finish. Hey. And Devil's Triangle was brought to us by these fine garage folks. We have Mike and Sean from Hillview, Kentucky. Like your jib. Next, we have Caroline who wants to say happy birthday to her friends Greta in Baltimore and Katie in Brooklyn. Sweet and also, Caroline. And also in Brooklyn, thanks to Philippa. And we have some offenders and parts unknown. Make sure that you wear your sandals when you're taking a shower. All right, let's open up the garage, Captain, and speak to the fine citizens of Parts Unknown for hooking it up this week. We have Alexandra, Jane, Vanessa, and Deborah. Mm-hmm. Back to your gym. But Move. make sure, but make sure you wear your sandals when you're taking a shower. It's a rule, people. Big shout out to Heather in Prosper, Texas. And up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we have mm-hmm. Leah. Boo. And let's say hi to Sarah down in Florida. And Marie up in Canada. Love our Canadians, right? Mm-hmm. Cheers, mates. And last but not least, we have Rob in Jonesboro, Arkansas, one of our hard-drinking buddies. I want to be the first one to wish him a happy St. Patrick's Day 2018. Mm-hmm. He will know what that means, and I want to wish all of you a happy Cinco de Mayo. I'm going to celebrate this Friday by eating nine tacos, breaking my old record. <laughs> And always, thanks for listening, whether you're listening at work or at your commute or whatever. Maybe you're just trying to get away from your significant other for a minute because they're driving you a little crazy. Thanks for joining us in the garage. Make sure you follow us on Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff at True Crime Garage. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The record reflects that the defendant is present along with counsel for the defendant. Both sides ready to proceed. It's been brought to my attention that the jury has reached the verdict. State? The state's ready to proceed, Your Honor. Defense? Defense is ready. To those in the gallery, please do not express any signs of approval or disapproval upon the reading of the verdict. Let's return the jury. State recognizes the presence of the jury. We do, Your Honor. And does the defense. Yes, sir, we do. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Have you reached a verdict? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Would you hand the verdict form to the court deputy, please? Would a defendant rise along with counsel? Madam Clerk, you may publish the verdicts. In the circuit court, for the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida. State of Florida versus Casey Marie Anthony. As to case number 2008, CF 15606-0. As to the charge of first degree murder, verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this fifth day of July, 2011, signed four person. As to the charge of aggravated child abuse, verdict as to count two, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, did it at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed four person. As to the charge of aggravated manslaughter of a child, verdict as to count three, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, did it at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this 5th day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of providing false information to a law enforcement officer, verdict as to count four. 
We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of providing false information to a law enforcement officer as charged in the indictment. So say we all dated Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of providing false information to law enforcement officer, verdict as to count five. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of providing false information to a law enforcement officer as charged in the indictment. So say we all dated Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of providing false information to a law enforcement officer, verdict as to count six. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Sorry. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of providing false information to a law enforcement officer as charged in the indictment. So say we all dated Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of providing false information to a law enforcement officer, verdict is to count seven. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of providing false information to a law enforcement officer as charged in the indictment. So say we all dated Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed for person. Madam Clerk, you may poll the jury. July 5th, 2011, only after 10 hours and 40 minutes of deliberation, the jury acquits Casey Anthony of first degree murder, aggravated manslaughter, and aggravated child abuse, but convicts her of all four misdemeanor charges of giving false information to law enforcement officers. So the jury didn't hold Casey Anthony responsible for Kaylee's death at all in any manner. Two days later, Judge Perry sentences Casey Anthony to one year in county jail and $1,000 in fines for each of the four misdemeanor counts of providing false information to law enforcement officers. The judge orders all sentences to run consecutive to each other with credit for time served based on three years credit for time served plus additional credit for good behavior. Her release date is set for July 17th, 2011. Now, Judge Perry announces that he will not release the jurors' names for at least seven days, saying that some people have disagreed with their verdict and would like to take something out on them. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like a sharp kick to the crotch. Well, we would learn later that several of the jurors would say that they had received death threats mm -hmm. uh, after the trial took place. August 10th, 2011. The Florida Department of Child and Family Services releases a report concluding that Casey Anthony failed to protect Kaylee and that Casey's actions or lack of actions resulted in the death of the child. So, now, I mean, yeah, but what does that matter? It, it's after the fact. It actually really, legally, it doesn't matter at all. It has very little legal relevance. Well, the FBI did a pretty interesting test you were talking about. Yeah, and this was something that we failed to get to yesterday. There was so much jam-packed in that show. We went through so much information that this kind of just got swept under, the, well, not swept under the rug, lost in the shuffle, we should say. But there was an interesting test that the FBI conducted, and this was a paternity test, and mm -hmm. they tested George and Lee, Casey's father and brother. And the thing here is th the first thought that the FBI had was that if she was, in fact, sexually abused by either of these people, that one of them could have been the father of right. Kaylee. Right. So they do the paternity test. There was some more thought going into this than just that, though. And I found this to be pretty interesting. Regarding Lee, her brother, mm -hmm. the suspicion was that the name Kaylee was a combination of Casey and Lee, that she knew that her brother was the father mm -hmm. and that she was... You know, naming the child after the both of them. Well, that'd be really sick. Yes. And, and both of those tests that were negative. George is not the father. Lee is not the father of Kaylee. Uh, we've we've heard who Casey says is the is the father. A reminder, she says that it was a, either a man that had been killed in a vehicle accident. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can't confirm if he's the actual father. The other thing that she had stated to her lawyers and to her defense team, and I believe her family as well, is that at a a party that she may have gotten drunk and 
the child was conceived that night. Right. Now, I think there's a few different versions of that story depending well, on who she's talking to. Casey's stories are better known as the troll tales. Well, in one of those versions, at least one of those, is that she was at this party and somebody may have put something in her drink and had sex with her against her will. Yeah. And that's how the the child was conceived. Right. Or the guy had to put something in his drink just to get through the process. The old one for you, two for me. On July 13th, 2011, Texas EquiSearch, which assisted in the search for Kaylee, sues Casey Anthony for the cost of the search. And now we'll cycle back to this in a little bit because there's quite a bit more story there. Uh, but following our timeline, on July 17, 2011, Casey Anthony is released from jail at 12.10 a.m. And she doesn't initially go home to her parents' house. She never goes back there. Well, she can't after the, the allegations that she threw out at trial. Right. And and, well, and then the hurt. I, I Look, I, I think she knew based on what her mom and dad were saying that they felt that there was some guilt there and she just didn't want to deal with them anymore. So it's now I'm out of jail to start a new life and she goes to live with a defense attorney. She's there for a little bit and then she goes to this kind of like church retreat woman's thing and she gets all religious. But it's because all that stuff is because she's broke. Right, right. And she's she's about to get more broke because Judge Belvin Perry rules that Casey Anthony must pay for the cost of the sheriff's search for Kaylee Anthony. Yeah, well, I mean, when you say, uh, my daughter's been missing for 31 days, and people start searching for your daughter, uh, you are lying. Right, right. Well, yeah, you come out at trial and say, well, she wasn't missing. Right. And she sued by the, uh, well, not sued, but she's ruled that she has to pay the sheriff's department over $200,000. Now, we talked about her being sued by Texas EquiSearch, and I'm not sure that we have discussed Texas EquiSearch before on this show. We, no, we, yeah, we talked about them. I, I thought so. We, we may have because they're, they're, they specialize in searching for missing persons, mm-hmm. sometimes organizing the searches, sometimes assisting, but always working with law enforcement. And they have done a lot of really good work over the years, thankfully locating many of the adults and children that they have been looking for over the years and finding a lot of them alive. A big we like your jib to all those volunteers. Tim Miller is EquiSearch's director and founder, and he founded the search and rescue organization in 2000. This was after the abduction and murder of his daughter, Laura. Laura is one of the victims in the three decades old Texas Killing Fields murders. Texas EquiSearch moved into the area to assist for the search of Kaylee Anthony. This was November 8th and November 9th of 2008, just a little over a month before her body was found. Right. And this is an expensive operation to come in there and look for somebody. And now that we get to trial and she states, well, the girl was never missing. I just let all these people spend all this money looking for her anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wants and his company wants some of that money back, and rightfully so. Yeah, bitch better have my money. Pay me what you want me. Now, Casey would also be sued by Zenaida Gonzalez. Remember, she there is a real person out there named Zenaida Gonzalez, mm-hmm. and she lives in Florida. She doesn't know anything about Casey Anthony or Kaylee Anthony. She never babysat maybe even a day in her life. Who knows? Right. Uh, but because this name was smeared all over the news by Casey, stating that Zanny the Nanny took her daughter... Well, she's going to come after her in court as well and sue her for defamation. Now, this case ends up just being kind of thrown out and doesn't really go anywhere. But Casey's still going to have to face the judge's ruling of paying the sheriff's department for the searches, as well as the lawsuit by Texas EquiSearch. And this is going to lead Casey Anthony into bankruptcy. She's going to file for bankruptcy, and she won't have to pay either of them back. Right, but during the bankruptcy trial... That we're going to have a bunch of depositions that come up that some red flags and really she's kind of out of the limelight at this point, mm-hmm. but this is a case that I think the media keeps going back to and trying to dig up more stuff. It's kind of very similar to me, like, um, John Benet Ramsey, right? Always going back to it, always trying to dig up some little other nugget. Well, and of course they've got to, they being the media has to flock to this bankruptcy hearing because, Well, there's players that were involved in the investigation 
and they want to hear what maybe what nuggets might fall out of those trees that didn't fall out during the original trial now that the uh, the smoke is cleared, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of those individuals is a man by the name of Dominic Casey. Now, he, uh, according to ID, and I mean ID, the, the channel, the, the TV channel, um, they, they, their words are that he worked for the defense team during the trial. And during the course of this, uh, he basically stated what? That Casey was paying Jose Baez for her defense with Sex. sexual favors. Mm-hmm. The troll tax. There was supposed to be a TV appearance. Yeah, a press conference. And she didn't want to go. Mm-hmm. She didn't want to do it. So last minute, and she was going to get paid for it. Now, the reason why it was set up by Baez was because she needed to pay for his services. Mm-hmm. So I'll set this thing up. We're going to get a little bit of money for it. That goes towards your payment of what you owe me. Well, and your defense, too, because you're going to have to bring in experts that you will have to pay for their time and their expert opinions. Well, yeah, but the overall service of what Baez is bringing you. Mm-hmm. So when he sets that up for you and you cancel, then that's one makes him look bad. I think it kind of makes you look bad. And then there's no money coming in. Mm-hmm. So this this uh, private investigators claimed that Baez said to her over the phone, well, now you owe me three blowjobs. Hmm. Now, to me, the devil's always in the detail. If he just stated, you owe me blowjobs or you owe me whatever, it, it, it doesn't hold as much weight as when somebody says, you owe me three blowjobs. That's a very more detailed statement. The other claims that he made makes that is when he went to their offices that he saw Casey running out of Baez's office naked. Yeah, he also claims that he spoke to Casey about this, and she stated to him that, well, she was broke, and she had to pay him for the defense somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, here's here's a quick thing here, though, Captain, I want to point out. Even though the ID network states very clearly that Dominic Casey worked for the defense during the trial, mm-hmm. first of all, that's a very incorrect statement, Okay. Dominic Casey did work for the defense. He at no time during the course of the trial worked for the defense. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's be very clear about that. What took place, the relationship between Jose Baez and Dominic Casey is this. Dominic Casey is a private investigator. He is a a well-known private investigator. He's been doing it for many years. Well, when this case came up, he presented himself to Jose Baez. And he said, you know what? I would like to work on the defense team as an investigator. He's offering to work for Jose Baez. Now, Jose Baez is telling Dominic Casey at the time, look, first of all, this defense does not have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We we can't afford a a private investigator of your level. Right. So Dominic Casey says, well, I will do this pro bono and work for the defense. And he does so for a while, not very long. Because at some point, Baez and him are not getting along. And so Baez decides to release Dominic Casey of working for the defense. Now, what happens is Dominic Casey, he so badly wants to be involved in this case. What does he do? He then goes to Casey Anthony's parents, George and George and Cindy, and says, you know what? Mm-hmm. I know you guys have an attorney, and it's not Jose Baez. They had their own attorney, uh, Conway. And he goes to them and says, you should probably have your own private investigators as well because Kaylee had not been found by this point. And so he says, I will work for George and Cindy Anthony pro bono as your private investigator. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we know that this is true other than Jose Baez saying this? Well, we know from the court transcripts, remember when Cindy was called to testify and they wanted to know if she in fact sent her private investigators to search the area where Kaylee Anthony was found one month before she was found Mm -hmm. and she disputed that, well, what private investigators were we talking about? We were talking about Dominic Casey, which the court transcripts describe him as working for Cindy and George Anthony at that time. This is November before the body is found. I don't know how long that he worked for Baez, but he didn't work for Baez anytime close to the trial starting, he didn't work for her or for him before the body was found. Um, So let's be clear about that. It makes it, it sounds a little more, 
It sounds a little more like a legit claim when they state that he worked for the defense during the course of the right, trial. Right, right, right. And the other claim that is kind of weird to me is he's saying that from the get-go, we were never looking for a lot for Kaylee to be alive. We always just assumed that she was dead, and we were looking for the dead body. Meanwhile, that's what we're looking for, but we're telling everybody else that we're going to find her. Yeah, I get that. And and I see what you're getting at because that presents itself as as the defense knew in the beginning that we to we are to be looking for not a missing girl but a dead girl. And the problem I have with that, Captain, I, I don't I don't dispute that statement. I believe I believe he was out there looking for a body, mm-hmm. not a missing person. And I think that maybe he might have even been sent out by the defense to do so. But he's also a private investigator. He's going to conduct his own investigation within what the confines of what he's told to do by the defense. What I mean by that, and the reason why I don't dispute it, and I don't think this is any should be anything negative towards the defense, because Jose Baez says very early in this case, when, when he took this thing on, he said that immediately he thought, you know what? I'm going to defend this woman that is involved in a missing child case that could very soon turn into a homicide case. Right. He stated that from the get go. And second of all, he also said that early in the defense, the first several weeks that he knew Casey Anthony, he could tell that she was not being honest with him because she didn't trust him. And so he was not believing anything that she said at the time. So, yes, they might have been looking for a missing girl. They were probably also looking for for a body. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing I want to throw in here, though, too, is that Dominic Casey also claims that he is the one that came up with the theory and presented it to Jose Baez that Kaylee drowned in the family swimming pool. Mm-hmm. He says he came up with that theory. Why? Because he said that he noticed from pictures of the Anthony Holm that the ladder was still up in the pool. Now, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to credit Dominic Casey with the other statements because a lot of those other statements I don't believe. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that he probably found the picture with the ladder still up in the pool. I do believe maybe he presented that to Jose Baez as a possible defense. But here, but here again, don't damn me for looking for a body when you're out there and at the same time saying, well, maybe she drowned in the pool. Sounds mm-hmm. to me like he's looking for a body as well. Furthermore, before she was found, this took place in November. Those, Dominic Casey was sent by the Anthony parents, by Casey Anthony's parents, to look for a body in the same area where the body was found. Now, the other thing here is we have a situation where this guy is a bit scorned, right? He was not only released by Jose Baez, but during the course of the Casey Anthony trial, it's presented in trial that, look, you have these so-called very competent private investigators out searching the very area where the body was found and they couldn't find it. You know, so it kind of discredits the whole private investigator It kind of discredits him and his profession. And I think he felt a little burned by that. I Maybe. think that I think he might have had some some thoughts on some things and decided to present them as possible things that he thought he heard or thought that he saw. Um, I, I I just look where I I have a problem with it is I don't see, I just don't see this happening. You know what I mean? I I feel like here's, here's where the breakdown begins. You have this private investigator. And when he first comes out, all these statements that they're making initially, Oh, well she paid for her defense team and sex. It almost seems like, this private investigator is a champion for Kaylee, right? Mm-hmm. That's what this is all about. Oh, this guy's a good guy. But then where maybe you don't believe those statements that, you know, she was uh, given blowjobs to pay for her defense. If you don't believe those statements, then don't believe the next statements. Because the next statements were like, guess what? I'm the one that came up with the defense that did such a good job mm-hmm. to get this crazy psychopath off. And that is not champion for Kaylee at all. Right. So I think I I buy the statements. I buy the, the, the ones that champion for Kaylee and the ones that don't champion for Kaylee. And I buy what he's saying, you know, and I think the evidence of that is you have to be pretty low 
of an individual. You have to be a pretty shitty ass human being to get up there and opening statements say, hey, guess what? You know where she learned to lie? You know where she learned to lie? From her father molesting her. The same father that raised your daughter. The same father that housed you. The same father that fed you. The same father that fed you plus your daughter. Plus every time that you didn't pay for a ticket. Who paid it for? Who who paid for your car? That did everything for you. And you throw this person under the bus. And I don't know who came up with the idea. But Baez had to say it. He's the one that made the claims. And other than the first initial cross-examination of George Anthony, they didn't bring this up because it was a bunch of bullshit. That, that's my opinion. But you have to be a pretty low human being to bring this up in trial and throw that in the face of a guy that's dealing with the death of his granddaughter. And I think, so that's the evidence that I have. I can see that on tape. You're making those claims. I don't like you. And then this guy's making these claims just backing up that you might be a piece of shit. I get what you're saying. You know, that, that Baez, he presents this information that, that George is a sexual abuser of his daughter, possibly hinting around maybe even the granddaughter as well. I get that that's, you're stating that he is saying some low down dirty stuff that he's not going to back up with any evidence that right. makes him a slime ball. Therefore, it's not too big of a leap to believe that he would that he would cross the line with with Casey uh, behind closed doors. I, right. I get what you're saying. As far as the trial goes and as far as those accusations go, um, my thoughts on that, it, it's it's tough. It's tough. Did he play dirty? I think Baez absolutely played a little dirty. Did he hit below the belt? I think so. Um, the issue you have there though, is he does have a duty to his client to look out for her best interest and no one else is. And if she comes up with this story and says, you know what, this is what happened and this is why it happened. He does have to present that at trial. We'll get right back to this after this quick beer break. All right, we're back. Yeah, and we have a lot of interesting theories to get to in this case now that mm-hmm. the the smoke is cleared, the verdict is in, Casey Anthony has disappeared off into the night. And what we're left with is wondering what truly did happen here. And recently we have learned about some very important theories, and those would be the parents of Casey Anthony, Cindy and George. Mm-hmm. Now, Cindy has a theory, and I would say it's probably, it doesn't sound to be spot on, definitely not spot on with what the defense would state and what the defense would claim, but it's very similar in the sense that case that Cindy Anthony believes that she, when she left for work that day on June 16th, that at some point Kaylee drowned in the pool. Right. And that Casey found her in the pool and panicked and that Kaylee was beyond the point of, of bringing her back of resuscitation. Right. And that she being a young mother, uh, in a traumatic situation, she panicked and she handled it very poorly that she decided to hide the body for whatever reason and almost kind of pretend like nothing happened. And one of the key points that people have to understand is that she eliminates George from the equation. Right. Uh, One of the things that we kind of talked about is it's odd to us. Uh, I think it's odd to you as well, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I got a mouse. I don't know what you're saying yet. Uh, (laughs) I can't agree. I don't know yet. Um, It's odd that they're still together that because of what they went through, it's not that it's odd, but it's kind of against all odds, right? Mm -hmm. That they're still together. Uh, But she eliminates him from the equation in her theory. Right. And you know what? I tell you what, I do want to throw something out in Cindy's defense. Mm -hmm. I I got curious and I looked something up the other day. And between the years of 1999 and 2010, nearly 14,000 Americans age 19 and under drowned uh, during those years. Right. Now, during that time period, 40% of those people 
were ages one to four years old. And half of those people drown in pools. So you're talking about like 200 kids. You know, this is where I get to to put on display my poor math for everybody as I'm trying to do it in my head right now. <laughs> you're supposed to show your work so you know that you're right, but we don't have time to do that. Right. So approximately over 200 kids between the ages of one and four, which Kaylee certainly would have fallen between those ages, drown in the, the United States each year in a pool. Yeah. Um, which is tragic. Of course, of course. And but it but it kind of goes to the defense of Cindy's theory. And we normally recommend a bunch of different true crime docs. I wasn't in love with the version of Discovery IDs, but I thought there was a few valid interesting points in that one being of the parents' theories. Mm-hmm. George's theory I think is very interesting. Yes, yes. And and, and like we said it's it's quite different from Cindy's and mm-hmm. from the defense's theory as well. Um, George does not believe that Kaylee drowned in the pool. Um, he basically states that he thinks that Kate, that Casey might've been giving the little girl something to, uh, knock her out, mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, Xanax, any form right. of, you know, different forms of drugs to kind of put her under from time to time. Yeah. Basically when they were talking to the DJ, her boyfriend's roommates, they kind of discovered this whole thought of, well, one of the things that they were calling Xanax was Zanny. Mm-hmm. And so when it became Zanny the nanny, like you just kind of put two and two together. So George believes that he's, that Casey's been medicating uh, Kaylee to, to put her out from time to time and mm-hmm. probably doing this for quite some time leading up to the little girl's death. And that he believes that she accidentally overdid it that day. Right. And she panicked and had to get rid of the body. And he says, looking back on it, hindsight, that there would be a lot of times that Kaylee would sleep, you know, sometimes 10 to 15 hours sometimes. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that she'd wake up and she'd be very groggy. Or that he saw dark, you know, rings around the eyes or dark spots around the eyes uh, that he he states that you wouldn't see or expect to see in a child of that age. So why would the two parents have such different theories is what I immediately ask myself. And I think the only thing I can come up with is that George, he left the house that day after Cindy did. Mm -hmm. He went to work after she did. And he states that he saw Casey and Kaylee leave the home together around 12, 1250 that afternoon. And that's why I think their theories are so different that he knows in his heart that he saw the two of them leave that day. He Mm -hmm. left for work and then he never saw his granddaughter again. And I think that, that, that ultimately is the biggest difference. Well, I maybe that. And I think the other thing that's a big difference is I think through the history of things, he wasn't, he was getting tired of enabling Casey. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think especially when you throw them under the bus and and your defense makes claims that you're sexually abused by your father, I think at that point it's just, I'm done. You know, Mm -hmm. my my granddaughter's done. I don't want to live anymore. And then on top of this, I have to go through all that. I'm just done with this. I think he's, he's more able to try to see the truth Mm -hmm. than, than Cindy is. Can I take you through my thoughts and my opinions on the case? And yeah, the whole world's waiting. The whole garage is waiting, holding their breaths. Uh, So don't hold back. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go through my thoughts on this case and what I believe to have happened and the trial itself, kind of all at the same time. But you know, starting off a little bit with the trial. Um, When the verdict first came down, I was as shocked as anyone. Um, I ultimately believed that she was guilty, Um, and then you know, I got to be. Full confession, I only half paid attention to the trial at the time of the trial. Right. It wasn't until we start re- started researching this case that I really dove in deep. And the thing is, when I was half paying attention to it, I believed her to be guilty from the time they marched her into the courtroom until the time they left. And then, then when they made the accusations against George, I thought, phew. You couldn't you couldn't get any more low than than what it already took place, and right. now you're dragging the rest of your family down with you. And so I was as shocked as anyone. But when I looked into this thing a lot more, I was not shocked uh, because of a few different things. 
Uh, first off, uh, focus groups. Now, we know that in the OJ case that the defense team used a focus group mm-hmm. to kind of decide of what, what people with what backgrounds do we want on this jury? What jurors do we think will, will like OJ? What jurors do we think will not like law enforcement, not right. like the prosecution? And let's stack our jury with these people. Well, in this case, we had, in Casey Anthony's case, we had a focus group. We had Jose Baez, and he worked with the 2020 or 48 Hours or one of those TV shows. They approached him, and they wanted to do a story on the case. This was before it went to trial. And their thoughts was they wanted to get the general public's reaction as to what they had heard so far about the case and whether they thought that Casey Anthony was guilty or not. Right. Well, when this all went down, he was able to sit behind mirrored glass and watch them interview these people and hear their responses to the different questions. He was able to pick up on what concerns did these people have? And the smart thing that I think happened here was that the TV play, the TV show, whichever Mm -hmm. one it was, decided to kind of gather up all these people from Orlando, Florida. Well, there was, there would be no city in the rest of the United States that already pegged her as more guilty than Orlando, Florida. So he had this room full of people that believed her to be guilty and he could figure out what was important to them. What did they need to hear in the course of the trial to give a not guilty verdict? Mm -hmm. He learned that they didn't care so much about forensic evidence that the, the people that they interviewed were more concerned with what was the cause of death and two, the searches on the computer at the Anthony home. Right. And I think he used that to his advantage. The second thing here about the defense and the trial was that the defense had two secret weapons that the prosecution and the public didn't even know that the defense had on their side. Mm-hmm. And those two things were George and Cindy Anthony. Because the jury and the public saw these two grandparents as victims. And then when they put them on the stand and they they pulled back the curtain, then we saw that they weren't telling the truth about certain things as well. So now we have people that go from being victims to being liars to being people that we cannot believe and we cannot trust. And that was a secret weapon for the defense. Something that the prosecution would have never seen coming. The thing here is Cindy... The the some of the the lies on the stand. Mm-hmm. She's almost coming to the def- defense of her daughter. Well, yeah, to save her daughter's life. And there were some there's some weird weird things that I found almost strange coincidences about some of those lies. Mm-hmm. And one of them being is when she talked about the search on the family computer, how she was the one that looked up chloroform. But she did it on accident because she was actually looking up chlorophyll. Right. And then it came up chloroform. Well, why would she look, why would she bother looking up chlorophyll? Well, she had this bamboo root growing in her backyard that we, that we needed to get rid of her, or the dogs were eating bamboo leaves and we needed to get rid of, make sure that the dogs weren't going to get sick from this. And what was another lie that we saw that Casey did during this, the course of this whole missing thing? She went and borrowed a shovel from the neighbor to remove a bamboo root from the backyard. Right. To me, that that made me wonder, was that Cindy's way of kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, tip of the cap to her daughter who's watching her testify, stating, you know what? I'm going to get your back. I'm going to lie for you. And, and almost cueing her to cue the defense team, say, don't worry, my mom's got this. You don't have to... You don't have to worry about this part of the trial. Right. She's she's covered this base. Well, but we also know that they had several conversations with each other, mm-hmm. Baez and Cindy. So what what conversations took place? And when the death penalty is on the table, I'm not going to put it past any parent to lie. And like I said, I physically get ill um, from from saying a lie. I don't know if if you know one of my yeah, step boys, you know, were on trial for, I don't know what I'd do. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the other thing here, captain that worked very well for the, for the defense. And I think really threw the jurors off on what was going on at the trial was George Anthony's reaction to the allegations of sexual abuse against his daughter. 
the thing here is mm-hmm. the situation is this, and the jurors would not have known this in advance, but George and Cindy knew in advance that Jose Baez was going to throw George under the bus and then back the bus up and run him over again. Right. They knew that. And they were told, you know what? You're going to be in court that day when it happens and you need to stay calm. You need to stay stoic. You just need to, you just need to sit there and be and let it trickle off of you like rain, man. And what I think, what I think the jury saw was that no reaction from George because most people would have would if if those were allegations against me and I was sitting in trial, I would have I would have jumped out of my chair, man. You would have had to pull me and peel me off of the roof, off of the ceiling. I would have been mm-hmm. the ceiling is the roof. Right, the ceiling. I, I, <laughs> I would have been I would have been livid. I would mm-hmm. have been livid, and he wasn't. And but he was instructed not to be so. Right, right. And the jury didn't know that. And and this is where I have a problem with some of our court proceedings. You know, we state that if you are a witness, you are not to be in the audience of the trial. Mm -hmm. But because they were the grandparents, they were grant they were granted the privilege of being in that courtroom. I think what happened was that affected justice for their granddaughter. Now, well, but had they, you had you given them the opportunity to not be there, I don't think they. I I think they would have insisted on being there. Right, I absolutely but, do. Right, but they, uh, you know, their lies and and the stuff that, the lies that they told on the stand and the lies they told to so many people affected justice. Well, and I think that they would have stayed given the you know if they were given the choice, which they were. But I don't think the choice should have been there, first of all. I Mm -hmm. think they should not have been in the courtroom. But given the choice, I think they would have stayed no matter what because it came off to me, and and it's probably this way for most people. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. But what I saw was parents that wanted the truth as long as it didn't give their daughter the death penalty. Right. right. And again, we discussed it. Uh, I don't think that the state should have sought the death penalty. I think we might have seen an ultimately a different outcome just if we wouldn't have sought the death penalty in this case. Well, yeah, we we all hope the troll dies and burns in hell, but um, it probably wasn't the smartest move. Now, you know? as far as what happened on that day, um, I th- I think and I believe that... And this is probably worse than what most people believe. Okay. I, be- I believe it was, I actually believe it was a planned murder. Okay. I, I think that Casey thought about taking Kaylee's life for months and at least days or even weeks before March, the month of March, when she searched for chloroform on that computer. Right. Uh, Kaylee died June 16th, almost three months after the search on the family computer when she couldn't wait any longer to free herself of the burden of her daughter and the burden of her own parents that she chose to live with, then long after she searched for chloroform on the family computer, well, she then searched, Googled foolproof suffocation on the family computer because Casey knew if she tried and attempted but failed, not only would the little girl live but she would tell her grandparents what her mother had done. And not only that, but Casey would have had to look Kaylee in the eyes knowing what she had done. So she couldn't screw it up. Okay. And just like she worked so hard for two years to maintain a lie and hide from her parents and hide from everyone else, the fact that she did not have a job, Mm -hmm. she studied long and thought hard how to kill that little girl. And so she took the chloroform and knocked Kaylee out. Then she took the duct tape and placed it over Kaylee's mouth and nose. And the chloroform served two purposes. One, the little girl didn't have to struggle as she suffocated and died. And two, because Casey is such a selfish person, this is probably the main reason for the chloroform so that Casey would not have to struggle with Kaylee when she was putting the duct tape on her. And so Casey wouldn't have to hear or see her daughter struggling as she dies. 
so that Casey could put the tape on her face and go into the other room as Kaylee dies. And while she was waiting, Casey checks her Facebook and her MySpace accounts. Mm -hmm. And while she's logged in, she changed both of her passwords to Timer55 because I believe Timer55 was a real thing, a very real thing. But it wasn't something that involved a fake nanny or a kidnapping of Kaylee. No, Timer55 was a countdown. The countdown from the 55 days from the day she killed Kaylee to the day that she knew that she could no longer hide the missing dead baby from her grandparents Mm -hmm. because they would be, it would be the baby's third birthday and the grandparents would demand to see Kaylee. And so Casey, now a free woman, free from her daughter, which she considered to be a ball and chain and free from the watch and the rule of her parents, Mm -hmm. she had 55 days to live it up. Wow. It's uh it's getting hot in the hot tub. Uh so you think it's just because that Kaylee was a burden? Oh, you mean the why? Well, yeah. I, I think the why is a lot harder than the how in this case. Um I think the burden was part of it. I I also obviously think that she didn't want to be with her parents anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think she thought that Kaylee was some kind of anchor keeping her to her parents. Um, which the sad thing here is I really believe if she wanted to tap out she, that her parents would have taken that baby for her yeah. and she could have, she could have left. i firmly believe that that w- would have been the case. Uh, I think for me, definitely the how is a, and why is uh, two different things. Um, well, part, part of me also wonders if, you know, it seems like there was a lot of, a lot of butting heads, a lot of uh, battling between Cindy and Casey. Part of me wonders if she wanted to punish Cindy in, in some way as well. For me, I think the why that there's so many reasons that she thought that she should do this. And right. second of all, um, I don't think she's clinically crazy. I think she's criminally crazy. And I think trying to rationale with, with crazy is not nothing that we can do. There's we we can't come up with the reasons why she would do this. Yeah, well, I, I think she's a, a sociopath, mm-hmm. probably. And I think the I actually think the why is pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think she ever wanted a kid. I think she felt pressured to do so. She. I think when people, you know, she came up with the lie, well, this guy was the father, and then he died several years later. And I think, I don't know if she was always a liar. I think she developed into this. And I think the more and more she had to be faced with reality, that she was just a loser. And she was just trying to get guy's attentions or whatever and I was drunk at a party and I really don't know who the father is so therefore I do not want to keep the baby and then I'm going to make the up this fictitious story about this guy is the father but he died we know that's a lie Mm -hmm. and then you get engaged to a guy that you said was the father and yet you cut off that engagement and the reason why was because she claimed that you love my daughter more than you love me. Mm-hmm. And then we see it again with the parents. The parents love the granddaughter more than they loved you. Then we see it again with the new boyfriend. You start bringing around your daughter in the beginning. And the roommate claims and other people claimed everybody liked Kaylee. Everybody thought she was so smart. And then all of a sudden... She's not coming around anymore. And I think the guy that she was seeing was probably giving the daughter some attention like a normal human would. And she couldn't deal with that. She, she needed the attention and this individual that she made her daughter always stole that limelight from her Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, Casey was and will always be, piece of shit loser Hmm. and I think that was the main motivation was you know 
you know, everybody cares about this person more than me. And I think there's more evidence of that in the, the tapes, hours and hours of the prison footage where he's, she's saying, but what about me? What about me? Right. And I think part of Casey wanted to say, I killed her and she's gone. Let's make this about me. And I, I I'm, I believe in your theory. Uh, the, I, the, what George Anthony says, I I buy most of it, and I believe that she. M- one of my big frustrating questions was before the actual murder. When you're drugging, I don't think this was the first time she ever drugged her with something, but I believe that Zanny the nanny was giving your daughter drugs to make her sleep. And I think sometimes she was sleeping at the grandparents' house. And I think sometimes that poor little girl was sleeping in the back of a car, maybe even the trunk of a car. And I, so that search that day of strangulation, there's no doubt in my mind that it was not an accident. It wasn't, I just gave her too much and she died. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, George saw her that night. I think she, she, she said, look, I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm not going to keep drugging her. I'm just going to get rid of her together as a problem. Mm-hmm. So I think me and your um, theories are pretty similar on this one. Mm-hmm. I like your thoughts on that, 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 that at one time in Casey Anthony's life, she was the nucleus of her world. And then when Kaylee came along, well, there was a new centerpiece of the world and it wasn't her anymore. And it was the centerpiece of her world and everyone that existed within Casey's world. Right. And she couldn't handle that. Right. And the, where we differ is on the, why she got off. Mm -hmm. And I believe what the prosecution says, somebody that was close to this case knew the evidence. All this evidence was out in the public size. Mm -hmm. And I think they had a bunch of individuals the only individuals that they could get on this case, on this trial, were individuals that were indecisive going in. Right, for to fill the jury pool. Right, which makes a lot of sense because you have to. It has to be fair. But if, but when all the information is pretty much out there in the open, and you're going in, in indecisive, just hearing the same story with maybe a few extra details added in here or there, is not going to change your mind. I think they went in indecisive and they left indecisive. Mm-hmm. And I think these little tiny things of them going, well, we didn't know where the murder took place or you couldn't tell me exactly what happened. You know, sh- she's lucky that Kaylee wasn't found sooner because I think a couple key pieces of forensic evidence would have, you know, put her in the electric chair. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. And the worst thing about all this is that this little girl doesn't get to grow up. Kaylee doesn't get to grow up and become something and then contribute to the world. Um, you know, because you can't pick your parents, mm-hmm. and it's sad. And I feel for the the Anthony family, everybody that was involved. I, I know sometimes it makes it seem like we're throwing certain people under the bus, but I feel for them overall. And, uh, you know, then, but then Casey comes out, uh, recently and says, well, here, I'm going to do an interview and I'm actually going to tell you, I don't know what happened. Right. I'm not even going to come up with another lie because everything I come up with, th- th- it's not the truth. And then the troll wants to say, oh, by the way, I sleep fine at night. Well, that's because you're a sociopath. And just because a handful of people that were indecisive and couldn't make up their mind said that you're not guilty, I think in the public's eyes, the public got it right. Yes, and we would all sleep better at night if we would have gotten a guilty verdict. And all I can say is I can't I can't stand this troll. No more. Troll trial is over. Thank God. How about some recommended reading, Captain? Yes, sir. This week, we are recommending Dangerous Behavior by Nancy Bush. Mm -hmm. Some couples are too good to be true. One look and it's clear they're perfect together. It's in the way they touch, talk, and kiss. 
They share the same interests, the same twisted passions. They do everything together, even kill. Uncover the deadly secrets hiding behind perfection and dangerous behavior. The latest high suspense thriller by New York Times bestselling author Nancy Bush. Dangerous Behavior is available now everywhere books are sold. And for more information, visit kensingtonbooks.com or nancybush.net. Thank you guys so much for letting us be a part of your lives every week. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for giving us five-star reviews. They really help us in the rankings on iTunes. Uh, Thanks so much. I'll be shipping out those shirts really soon. And uh, cheers, everybody. Yeah, and may the fourth be with you all. Happy Cinco de Mayo. We'll see you next week here in the garage. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.